Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. I do hope you're doing remarkably well and lots of love. And tell me what you're drinking, what you enjoy drinking, and of course, what you're doing this Christmas season, whether you're going away to friends or family, because it's lovely hearing from you. So before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell and the thumbs up. But before we get started, I would like to remind you that this is going to be part two of the story that I'm going to be sharing with you tonight. So if you haven't heard part one, just go back to part one before you hear the rest of the story. So those of you who listened to last night's story, this is the second part. Otherwise, go back to part one. So let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, part two. I'm glad to inform you that for the next couple of days, they were very uneventful. I wasn't about to complain about that at all. I was exceedingly happy with the routine monotony. I hoped that things would stay as humdrum as possible. We were pretty much snowed in, as the weather was unrelenting in its disregard for our comfort, as the incessant snow continued to fall. The ravages of the punnelling winds hammered and beat against the chapel, so that it rattled and almost shook like a boat out on a tempestuous, turbulent, unsettled sea. I didn't even want to brave the elements or go out of doors, for if I so much as opened the door, the wailing wind would literally throttle me with its hands, almost lifting me off my feet and blowing me away. It certainly didn't help that it was bitterly cold out there, searing bone to marrow, making the very idea of going outdoors about as appealing as eating a sheep's eyeballs. I know that in some cultures eating sheep's eyeballs are considered a delicacy, but most certainly not for me. In my eyes, they're absolutely revolting. Let's just say such weather is an acquired taste. It certainly wasn't for me. I was used to bad weather, living in Scotland, but this boisterous raging storm was one of a kind, and it wasn't for the faint-hearted. So me and Lachlan made the most of reading books together. Thankfully, there was a vast selection of good fiction in the bookshelves, which was our saving grace. We were both prolific readers, so we curled up happily on the sofas by a crackling fire and made ourselves as comfortable as possible, eating hot meals, drinking copious amounts of hot beverages. So much for the chapel being a romantic place, it was anything but. It was so bitterly cold and oppressive, not what you'd expect from a place of God. I think all these beautiful stained-glass windows, as lovely as they are, did not provide the same kind of protection against the elements, like double glazing clearly would have done. It was on the third day when the windy weather had laconically subsided, taking a brief respite. It would seem the raging storm had a contrary mind all of its own. It wasn't intending on calming down its aggressive stance any time soon, but it appeared to be taking a moment's breather from the hammering, pounding air rather like a celestial vacuum cleaner, as if the windy Hoover extension had been switched off at the mains, disabling its electric connection for a while. I was standing by the kitchen sink washing the dishes, my hands thoroughly enjoying the warmth of the soap suds, as I wiped the soap dishes thoroughly clean with a scouring brush. Suddenly as I was glancing out of the window, I saw a large solid flash of black moving swiftly past me, looking in at me. Was I mistaken? I couldn't be sure. Had I actually seen that? Had I actually seen anything at all? Surely not. I'm going out for a second, I told Lachlan, throwing the scouring brush back into the soapy water. I scurried hastily towards the entrance hall, quickly grabbing my anorak off the hook, throwing on my boots. Are you sure that's a good idea, sweetheart? I could hear my husband saying. But his words dissipated like the steam from a kettle, as I'd long since opened the door courageously embracing the elements, as an icy, bracing chill numbed my skin. But at the very least, the evanescent, spirited winds had been fugaciously abated, for the time being at least. Enough time, I hoped, to do a little investigating and exploring of my own, to appease a rather inquiring mind that was excitedly doing flip-flops in eager anticipation of my search. I was now outside, staring in awesome wonder at the smooth, untarnished, immaculate white wilderness before me, that was so transfixing in its breathtaking beauty. It was so pristine, only disturbed by this long trail of Herculean-sized cookie-cutter-like footprint depressions that had gouged out their vast shape in the snow. I gawked in astonishment as I studied them, 
I mean, who in the world has feet this large? Furthermore, who walks in the ice-cold snow in their bare feet? I could see pronounced toe-mark indentations, which ruled out the possibility that the flash of black I'd seen only moments before in the kitchen was a bear. It most certainly was not. Bears do not have toes. I made a foot impression of my own next to the print. I was absolutely astonished to see how tiny my footprint seemed by contrast. I now knew unequivocally that I'd definitely seen something outside the kitchen window. But what it was, that was the baffling, mysterious question. Whatever it was, I knew it was profoundly real. I was exceedingly inquisitive. Fear was not even engaged in my thinking, not at all. On the contrary, I was absolutely fascinated, exceedingly intrigued by what I'd seen. I resolutely resolved to follow the footsteps. I wanted to see where they would lead. I was to realise whatever this thing was that I was following most certainly had monstrous five-foot strides, so it must be titanic in its proportions. I mean, who in the world walks with such a large stride? No one I knew. The mysterious enigmatic footsteps led through a long line of Douglas fir trees, so I cautiously stepped up my speed as my feet treaded prudently through the thick snow, meandering judiciously through the trees. Their boughs were heavily draped by thick overlays of glistening snow. There in the woodgrove I could see a large igloo-like shelter, made out of clusters of timber, needled branches, green offshoots, bracken, pieces of hedgerow, briars and hay, cemented skilfully together with heavy bricks of snow. It was built up masterfully against a rocky outcrop, so that it blended uniformly with the rocks. Indeed, it was so meticulously camouflaged by snow, so irreproachable, that I probably wouldn't have seen it at all, if the giveaway footsteps had not been so conspicuous. Whoever was living inside the igloo had made only one blunderous gaff, and that was not brushing its footsteps away. If the creature, whatever it was, had surreptitiously covered its tracks, I would never, ever have uncovered its hiding spot in a million years. Not a chance. That was how indefectibly concealed it was. Suffice to say, to be fair to the creature, this was a remote, uninhabited part of the world. If the creature did think someone was staying in the chapel, if by any chance it might have seen me, it would possibly wisely conclude that no one would foolishly brave the elements like I had done, as most people would be a whole lot more sensible and circumspect than I was. But then I wasn't most people. By nature I was spontaneously impulsive, sometimes to my gross detriment. I hoped that this would not be the case in this situation. This was certainly not the kind of arbitrary storm you played around with for fun. It was reckless and unpredictable. I stood there for a moment, my eyes fixed on the shelter, wondering what I should do. I wanted to see what was inside that igloo, more than anything in the entire world. It was like I had an audacious itch I desperately needed to scratch. I was voraciously impatient to know what I'd seen, but also I had enough sense to know that whoever was occupying that shelter could potentially be dangerous. Let's just say I didn't think about that possibility too much, as it would have robbed me of the confidence to do what I did next. This was when I had a stroke of genius, well, so I thought at the time, but on reflection I'm not so sure my actions were that sagacious. I decided I would throw something at the structure, to see if I could get the creature to come out. But I would hide in the shadows, so that it would never see me. I mean, honestly, who on earth was I kidding? I can't believe the level of my naivety. But there you go, Rome wasn't built in a day. I rolled a substantial amount of snow up into a sizable ball, gingerly throwing it at the igloo. It hit the corner of the structure, making a loud crashing sound, as the snow dissipated, as it hit the edges of the igloo. I stood very still, my heart beating a little faster. I took a deep breath, peeking behind the trees like a mischievous school kid, waiting for some kind of reaction. But nothing happened. I tried again. Once again I rolled up the snow into a large snowball, hurling it vigorously, swinging my arms as hard as I could for maximum impact. Surely it would be a distinguishable sound, as the howling winds had stopped. Some of the snow broke apart. It went flying into the opening, making a violent banging sound as it hit the ground. Nothing was to prepare me for what I was to see next. In truth, I don't even know what I was expecting to see. I heard a distinctive rustling noise as something was shuffling around in that igloo. Then a dense, black, shadowy, solid form began to crawl out of the structure, on hands and knees, rising to its feet. 
I audibly gasped. What in God's name was this creature? I'd never seen anything like it before. It stood up proud and tall like a man, at about eight foot seven hundred pounds. Its lofty, dense, burly silhouette was covered in long, flowing hair, the colour of black coal, that was so pronounced against the white snow. The thing that captivated my scrutiny and hijacked my attention with an extreme sense of bewilderment was how human the face of this creature appeared to be, along with a human-shaped body, a pair of small pert breasts, human hands and feet, although the arms on the creature were overlong, and the head was a pyramid shape. I was dumbfounded by what I was perceiving. I just stared at this creature in wondrous awe, hoping that she would not see me hiding there behind the tree. I had, of course, underestimated the intelligence and cunning discernment of this creature. To my immense amazement, the creature's eyes spun around like a needle on a magnet, priming in on my exact location with a pinpoint accuracy. I tried to remain terribly still. My body began to tremble and wobble like a jelly. I think it was knowing that she had seen me that sent the fear of God passing through my veins. My heart began to crash around in my chest like a gibbering idiot. Oh my God, she'd seen me, or at the very least she knew exactly where I was. I hadn't anticipated this. I knew the creature was exceedingly intimidating. I'd seen her. She was powerful, majestic, huge. If she became remotely violent towards me, I was as good as dead. Should I run? Should I stay very still? I couldn't decide what course of action to initiate. The creature seized that decision from me as she graciously glided towards the tree where I was hiding. She stood yards away from me, her eyes looking into mine. For a long while we just stared at each other. I think she was trying to comprehend what the heck I was doing out in this weather. Suffice to say there was nothing malicious or hostile about the creature, which did surprise me. On the contrary, her eyes were terribly kind, but they did register a deep concern. I realised she was exceedingly worried about me, being caught out in the storm. She was right. Suddenly the weather that had calmed down for a brief interlude while I'd ventured out of doors, all but shifted, renewing its viciously hostile and fierce advance, as sheets of icy cold air began to blast against me. I turned around to move towards the chapel. I knew I'd better be getting back, or I would be caught up in this feisty storm that was gathering wind speed at a rapid impetus. The creature stood very still, watching me, but she could see I was struggling. I've never known howling gale force winds like this before. They beat against me like a boxer's pounding fist so rigorously that I fell backwards onto the ground, clamouring furiously back onto my hands and feet, as if wrestling with an invisible man. I was being thrust backwards by forceful commanding hands that barricaded my path back to the house. What the hell did I think I was doing embracing the elements like this? Did I have a death wish or something? I was absolutely freezing. The wind was blowing up streams of icy debris across the escarpment, like a rambunctious deadly sandstorm. The cold was biting, my body aching, while the fingers on my hands were frigid and stiff in my gloves. My eyes barely able to see, as the whistling wind blasted icy particles into them, so that they began to water profusely. I turned around to see the creature still standing there, her body solid and firm like a powerful secure tree, unmoved, unstirred, unaffected by the cruel weather, with her well-grounded powerful legs rooted securely to the earth by the foundations of her brute strength. She was watching me in bewilderment. There was a flicker of uncertainty in her deep-set dark eyes, as if she was pondering whether she should help me or not. Then she was there at my side. I could feel her breath on my face. She looked directly into my eyes. I heard the words in my head, Let me help you. The next thing I knew was she lifted me into her overlong arms, carrying me directly towards the chapel like a baby. She was so powerfully strong that she moved like the wind and wasn't held back in any way. I could feel the rise and fall of her heartbeat as my head was cradled against her chest. Finally she put me down outside the door. Then she stood still as though waiting. I looked at her and said, Thank you. The creature watched me open the door then satisfied that I was safe inside the chapel, glided away, looking back only once to give me a brief congenial nod. It was only when I returned to Scotland after doing some intense research that I discovered the kind creature that had helped me was known as a Bigfoot or a Sasquatch. I quickly dashed into the chapel. 
My husband by now was fast asleep by the fire, with an Agatha Christie book clasped in his hands. He looked up at me as I stared at him, with a transfixed expression on my face. "'What the heck is wrong with you?' asked Lachlan. "'You look like you've swallowed a goldfish.' "'I may well have done,' I said. "'You'll never believe what happened to me out there. "'A strange hairy creature carried me back to the house, "'as the storm was so fearsome. "'She was so nice, covered in hair. "'She looked human.' "'Lachlan looked at me as if he thought I'd lost my mind, "'so I decided to quit while I was ahead. "'How could I possibly explain something so anomalous like this? "'If I couldn't make sense of what I'd encountered,' How could he? It would be like saying, Oh, by the way, I've just encountered a fairy. My story would seem nonsensical and outer-worldly to him. What are you talking about? What did you say you saw? Oh, it was nothing, I said. I must have seen a bear, I lied. Of course, I wish my story about staying at the chapel would end there, but it didn't. It was on the fourth night of our stay that I woke up with an inauspicious, portentous feeling that I wasn't alone. I felt as if something was watching me while I lay in my bed, but there was nothing there. I told myself I was going stark raving mad. My heart thumped in my chest, but I managed to calm myself down. I pulled the duvet cover over my head, trying desperately to sleep, but my eyes remained wide open. Maybe I should have woken Lachlan up, I thought, but then if I woke him up, he'd think I was losing my mind, so I decided better against it. Besides, he was notoriously grumpy if I woke him up prematurely. Telling him that I thought we weren't alone in my bedroom would likely facilitate a petty squabble between us, where I would be informed that my imagination was overactive. How I managed to drift off to sleep, I don't know, but I did. Then I felt someone nudging me, as if they were tapping me. They kept calling my name. It sounded like a woman's voice. Sky! 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 I woke up with a start, but when I looked around the bedroom, there was no one there. That was when I saw an indentation form at the end of my bed. I screamed. Lachlan woke up. What the hell is wrong with you? Why are you screaming? There's someone in here, I trembled, pointing towards the end of my bed. My eyes round with terror. Lachlan, I promise you it was a woman's voice. She called my name. Look, there's an indentation at the end of my bed. Can't you see it? I promise you she was sitting over there. The duvet was straight before. Now there's a definite imprint. It happened before my eyes, Lachlan. I promise you I'm not making this up. Lachlan rolled his eyes in frustration, as if he didn't believe a word I was saying. You are very impressionable, Sky. I'm sure it's nothing. You're just imagining things. Ever since you learnt about the graveyard behind us, you've allowed your mind to play tricks on you. Lachlan could say what he liked, but I knew what I'd seen. It freaked me out. I do not know how I managed to fall asleep, but I did. Lachlan's account. From the very beginning, I wasn't exactly thrilled to be going to stay in a chapel. I was eager to visit America, of course I was. But I never envisaged my first taste of this grand, remarkable, illustrious country would be staying in a Gothic chapel, of all things. I mean, who does that? Isn't that an absurd choice of accommodation? But my wife has always been unorthodox. I knew me and my wife needed a break. So when she became excited about this house swap online, I didn't want to disappoint her by erring on the side of caution, which I wish I had. Skye has always been impulsive, a hopeless utopian romantic. For her, the idea of staying in a chapel with stained glass windows and a bell tower titillated all her fancies and dreams. I mean, who was I to rob her of this whimsical, enchanting ambition of hers? So I decided to go along with the preposterous, rather loopy idea. Isn't that what husbands do to appease their wives? Sometimes make less than desirable sacrifices on their accounts, or to keep the peace. After all, don't they say happy wife, happy life? I've always embraced that theory. It's worked in my marriage. What I never knew was that we would end up pretty much snowed in when we arrived at our destination, facing the most dreadful harrowing storming conditions, where we would hear the wind howling outside the chapel for days at a time as everything rattled and shook precariously. Worse still, we were staying at a place that sent a chill down my spine. It was unnaturally cold all the time. I always had the impression we were being watched. I don't know how to describe it to you, but the place had a baleful, foreboding ambience. Of course, I didn't want to show Sky I had my reservations, as it would have spoilt the mood of our holiday. I did tell her I found the place rather sinister. Needless to say, I decided to adopt a positive, upbeat attitude about our stay. 
There was no point in becoming woebegone or disillusioned. We had to make the most of a bad situation. Obstensively, when I discovered that there was a graveyard in the backyard, it certainly didn't ingratiate me towards the place. I didn't want to tell Skye about my macabre discovery, as I knew such a revelation to her would go down like a lead balloon, but I had to tell her. I could see her blue eyes fill with fear. Sky had a ghostly encounter when she was fifteen years old in a cemetery in Scotland. If she had the slightest inkling that there were gravestones around this chapel, wild horses could not have dragged her to stay in this place. It was a hostile place, as if something or someone didn't want us here. Sometimes a place can give off that menacing ambience that instinctively warns you that something's not quite right. Then there was the curious question of the house dust and cobwebs. I certainly didn't get the impression that this house had been lived in for quite a while. I believe our hosts had been more than a little economical with the truth. As to why that was the case, I wasn't entirely sure. It was on night four when my wife woke up screaming. She was totally convinced that there was someone in the bedroom with us. She said she'd heard a disembodied woman's voice whisper out her name. She pointed to the area of her bed, where there was a deep indentation on the mattress. What I didn't tell my wife was that a woman had also whispered my name in my ear, but this was on night three, so I was fully aware that we weren't alone in this chapel. I just hoped that the ghost, whoever she was, would leave us alone. But I made a classic mistake. I told my wife that there were no such thing as ghosts, that once the dead were dead, they were truly gone. I told her that the dead could not interact with the living, and that the hollow indentation at the end of her bed was possibly made by us. Of course, my wife knew I was talking through my backside. She knew from personal experience that a person can indeed interact with a ghost, as it had happened to her with four of her friends back in Scotland. What I didn't realise was that I'd inadvertently almost challenged the ghost to interact with us. I was saying, you're not real, you don't even exist. Believe me, that was a monumental mistake on my part. So things got very interesting for us on night five, when the female apparition was determined to make herself known, so that her presence in the chapel could not be denied or disregarded any more. I'm so scared, my wife said to me when we retired to bed that evening. I'm scared that ghostly woman will come back. Don't be ridiculous. She doesn't exist, Skye. She's not real. I think she comes from the graveyard in the back, my wife persisted. I don't even think. I know it. But why is she bothering us? What does she want? I mean, the caretaker at the cemetery in Scotland believed he was taking care of the cemetery in death. But what does this woman want with us? Why was she calling my name last night? That's what I want to know. What does she want with me? Calm down, Skye. You had a bad experience in a cemetery once. You're allowing your personal demons to torment you. I wish we could leave this place, she said, shuddering. When is this bloody storm going to stop? Then we can book into a hotel or something. This place gives me the creeps. I feel as if we're being watched all the time. Worse than that, I feel as if we're being scrutinised. I feel that whoever is watching us doesn't want us here. You're just letting your imagination run away with you, Sky. Well, I'm sorry, Lachlan, but I'm going to sleep with my bedside light on tonight. I'm not going to sleep in the dark. I refuse to. Be my guest, I said, throwing the covers over my head. Now let's get some sleep. We could hear the wind outside battering the chapel. Everything rattled and shook. But eventually I fell into a deep sleep, as over the last few days we had acclimatised to the noise. I was awoken to hear my name being whispered. Lachlan! Lachlan! came a woman's voice. But I ignored it. I stayed still, squeezing my eyelids tightly, while my heart thumped loudly in my chest. Even my palms began to sweat. That was when I felt something nudging me. I thought it was my wife, so I sat up. What is it, Sky? I groaned. And that was when I saw a grey swirling mist circulating at the end of my bed, beginning to take shape. At first it became like a black shadow that thickened, became foggy and dense. Then it was as if details began to develop on the shadow, until it morphed into a grotesquely ugly woman in a black dress, standing at the edge of my bed, staring down at me through vacuous eyes. She gave me a provocative, toothless grin. Very vindictive. I sensed she wanted to show me that she was there and that she was real. I gasped, then she dematerialised before my eyes, but I nearly jumped out of my skin when I physically heard the clip-clop of her shoes walking to the side of my bed. I could sense she had stopped yards away from me. I could hear and feel her presence. Now I began to breathe very fast. 
I felt her standing next to me, but I saw nothing there. Then I heard her voice screaming in my ear, Get out! Get out! Get out now! I could see my wife's bedside lamp was off, as there had been a power cut, but now it began to flicker on and off simultaneously. Sky! Sky! Wake up! What's the matter? she asked, studying me curiously. You look as if you've seen a ghost. Don't tell me you have. Your face is as white as a sheet. You're trembling. What's wrong? I was hardly going to tell my wife I'd seen a ghost. That would only affirm her worst fears, give her cause to overreact. One thing I certainly knew was I wanted to get going to leave this place. I didn't know what this ghost was capable of doing. I didn't want to stand around and find out. I no longer cared about the storm out there. It seemed so much less worse than what was inside the chapel. I wanted out of this place as fast as possible, and there was no time like the present. We're leaving now, I said. Grab all your stuff. We're going. But why? gasped my wife. What about the storm? It's so dangerous out there. You heard what they were saying on the radio. Some of the roads are still not safe. Why all the sudden change of mind? I don't give a stuff about the storm. Get your stuff. We're going now. Jenna Hudson's account. I'm not going to lie. What's the point in doing that? Of course I had been lying on line to Sky McNally. I told her we lived in a chapel near Mount Rainer. We did. But it wasn't entirely true, as we no longer physically lived there. But I thought it would be best to be economical with the truth. If I told Sky why I wasn't living in the chapel any more with my husband, then she would be unlikely to engage in the house swap with us. I didn't want that to happen. It was a dream of mine to go to Scotland. I'd been told it was one of the most beautiful countries in the world to visit. When Skye told me about her idyllic whimsical stone cottage in the Scottish Highlands, I just knew I wanted to stay there, so it was a no-brainer for me. I couldn't resist. I knew Scotland was the land of castles and locks, Scottish myths, legends and fables. If there was any place in the entire world where you were likely to encounter a haunting, it would be a country like Scotland, surely. So maybe, just maybe the couple had encountered a ghost at one stage. I didn't want to tell them there was a ghost at the chapel, of an angry woman, a woman who didn't want us there, a woman who would throw a hissy fit if anyone stayed at the chapel. That was the real reason me and my husband Walter had abandoned the place. We were now living in Seattle with Walter's parents, getting under their skin. So the idea of a two escape in Scotland became infinitely more appealing to us, even if it was during an unseasonable time of the year. When I told Sky McNally we were kindred spirits, I wasn't lying either. I'd also been excited when the chapel near Mount Rainer came on the market. It was my idea to convert it into a home, a home that practically oozed an illustrious history. Of course my husband thought it was an insane, preposterous idea, but I managed to persuade him that the chapel was a sound investment. One thing that did bother me greatly was the graveyard at the back of the property, but somehow I persuaded myself it was nothing to concern myself about. After all, it only added to the charm and sentimentality of the place. The little chapel had been erected in 1906 by a woman called Florence, who was eager to introduce the locals in the area to a Christian faith. But it was her spiteful, malicious sister Constance who had filibustered all her sister's dreams due to an intense sibling rivalry and a touch of the green-eyed monster. Professedly, it was a classic Cinderella story, where Florence had been subjected to abuse by a begrudging stepmother who despised Florence, who was stunningly beautiful as a woman, with a heart of an angel. As far as anyone knows, there was a plethora of eager men seeking her hand in marriage, many who were men of sizable means, who could offer Florence a very upper-class standard of living, where she could escape the mediocrity of her lower-middle-class life. Florence refused all their gallant proposals, preferring to live a sacrificial life. She was a woman of great faith, believing she was on a mission to spread the good news of the gospel of God's grace. Without doubt, she punnelled all her energy in her mission work, where she worked with a minister, a man called Douglas Wilder, who was the man responsible for building the chapel. It is to be presumed that her invidious sister sabotaged everything that Florence and Douglas did together. In every regard, she was jealous of her sister. Constance had never had a marriage proposal a day in her life, it was believed that she physically vandalised her sister's chapel over and over again, while undermining her sister's efforts to grow the chapel's congregation by spreading vindictive lies, 
false rumours and nasty gossip about her sister, and also about the minister Douglas Wilder, in order to destroy their generous reputations, incapacitating their ability to do good for the community. Unfortunately, Florence died prematurely from a bout of pneumonia, so her dreams in regards to her mission project were never fully realised or completed. To all intents and purposes, soon afterwards her sister Constance died as well, having caught Florence's raging infection. Maybe divine justice intervened after all. It goes without saying that Constance died a bitter, twisted, angry woman. It would appear that both sisters are buried in the graveyard, but I believe it is Constance who haunts the place to this day, trying to drive people away from the chapel, as she did in life, to extract her ultimate revenge on her sister, which was why we encountered her wrath when we moved into the chapel. Of course we knew nothing about the chapel's history when my husband and I purchased the place. I remember being incredibly excited the first time I laid eyes on the chapel. I fell hopelessly in love with it. I knew that I knew that I had to have it. Needless to say, my husband Walter did not share my enthusiasm. He wasn't eager to go through with the purchase, but I can be persuasive if needs must. I dreamed of transforming a church building into a sumptuous cosy home. He said the place gave him the chills. I thought he was being absolutely ridiculous. You see, Walter's not the kind of man that appreciates home steeped in a rich, vibrant history. It's not to say he doesn't understand the beauty of a historic building, but he'd rather not live in one. If indeed he had his way, I'm in no doubt he would be desirous to buy a modern contemporary home with seamless glass finishes and plenty of granite. When we purchased the chapel, we hired a couple of builders to transform the interiors while maintaining the chapel's integrity. The two builders we hired were more than a little eager to get the project finished as they claimed they felt they were being watched all the time, that they could hear a woman coughing, but there was no one there. It rarely haunted them. They both said they felt as if something definitely didn't want them there. Up until then, I had never believed in paranormal stuff. In truth, I thought it was erroneous. I do remember one of the builders saying to me, you're very brave, ma'am, to live in a home with a graveyard at the back. I didn't think it was any different to having a family plot which is often the case in older family homes. Why would this be any different? I even said as much. He said to me, but ma'am, there are about 70 graves in the back, all from the early 1900s. I honestly didn't know what he was on about. Besides, I thought the graveyard in the back added to the mystique of the place, made the place infinitely more interesting, as graveyards are always fascinating. I could see the others did not share my enthusiasm. Many of my guests who visited the chapel always commented that they wouldn't be comfortable to have a graveyard at the back of the property if they were wearing my shoes, but they weren't, were they? Why should I care what they thought? Once me and Walter moved into the chapel, we always felt as if we were being watched. I kept that feeling at bay, but Walter kept expressing his misgivings about the place. I think we were a bit impulsive buying the chapel, he would say. I get a sense something doesn't want us here. When we were asleep at night in the chapel, there were occasions we heard a woman coughing. I would be preparing a meal in the evenings and we would often hear a coughing as well. Walter would say, did you cough? I would say, no, I didn't. He said I could swear I heard someone coughing. Even though I heard the cough, I pleaded ignorance, pretending I hadn't heard it. We began to hear a woman's shoes walking around the chapel at night. Then there were occasions we would see a shadowy form sitting in the pew, but I thought it had to be a trick of the light. I wanted to believe that. One day we were sitting eating dinner, and my glass of wine was flung from the table, shattered against the wall. I was trembling so much, I said to Walter, Did you see that? He nodded, his eyes were round, his face discomposed. He said, I told you, I don't like this place. One day as I was casually strolling in the graveyard, it was the middle of the day. I saw the strange woman wearing a 1900s dress staring at me. I was wondering who she was and what she was doing in my backyard. She was wearing a frown on her face. But then she dematerialized before my very eyes. It was an airy, surreal feeling. In the weeks that followed, I'd see her shadowy form moving around the chapel. It gave me a cold chill. One night the power went off in our home for no explanation at all. We couldn't get an electric connection, which was exceedingly odd. We'd have to call an electrician out in the morning. So we put a few candles on around the house so that we could see our way clearly if we needed to get up to go to the cloakroom in the middle of the night. I awoke with a sudden start when I heard someone tapping urgently on the window. 
I cried out in horror when I saw this dark, shadowy silhouette standing outside, looking at me with troubled eyes. The creature seemed undaunted by me. It seemed eager to get my attention. It kept pointing towards the living room area of my home. I realised this creature outside in the backyard looking at me through the window pane was a Bigfoot. It was the scariest creature I've ever seen. This was when I smelt the smoke. I quickly ran towards my husband, shaking him wide awake. He was fast asleep. Hadn't he heard me cry out? We dashed into the living room area, were horrified to find that our settee and one of our rugs was on fire. My husband found the fire retardant foam. We managed to kill the flames. We heard a woman's disembodied laughter as we frantically tried to put out the blaze. Me and my husband had no idea how a Bigfoot knew that our house could potentially have gone down in flames. If that creature hadn't woken us up, I'm almost certain we would be dead, which was a very discomposing thought. My husband perceived that maybe the creature had a great sense of smell and could smell the smoke from far away, choosing to warn us about the danger we were in. We knew the candle falling over was no accident. It would have had to have been deliberately pushed over intentionally for a fire like that to break out. The next day when the electrician came to examine our electric box, for some unexplainable reason, the electricity came back on. It was incredulous. Me and my husband called a psychic around to the chapel. She was one of those people that draws pictures of what she sees. She was able to establish a connection with a malevolent ghost called Florence, who she claimed was haunting the chapel. Even in death, she was spewing hatred towards her sister Constance, driven by a vendetta to get everyone out of the chapel, which included me and Walter. She even admitted to tipping over the candle. I remember the psychic drew a picture of the ghostly lady. She was wearing a high-waisted fluted skirt and a puffed blouse. I knew it was the very same woman I had physically seen in the graveyard. She also made some inquiries, which is how we found out about the history of the place, which verified her findings about Constance's desire to ruin her sister Florence. Needless to say, after our tumultuous experience in the chapel, me and my husband chose to move out. The psychic assured me that she had got rid of the ghost of Constance, but she did say there were no guarantees that Constance might come back, a fact I wasn't willing to reveal to our house guest, I'm ashamed to admit. I must confess my husband wasn't best pleased with me when I did this house swap with Skye and Lachlan McNally. He told me that the least I could do was to warn them about the possibility that Constance might be haunting the chapel again, but I couldn't do it. To cut a long story short, after I returned from my incredible holiday in Scotland, Sky opened up to me about everything that had happened to her while staying at the chapel. I realised that the ghost of Constance was back. I couldn't believe it. I also learnt that the Bigfoot female who had warned us about the fire had escorted Sky back to the chapel in a feisty windstorm. Suffice to say we got an offer on our chapel by a man who loves investigating the paranormal. He bought the haunted chapel from us, claiming that he's seen the ghost of the angry Constance several times. Good luck to him. I wouldn't want to be wearing his shoes, but he claims to love the place. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.